Hi everyone, welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast. Portable gas detection meets the wireless internet of things. What it can do for you. Sponsored by Blackline Safety. My name is Tom Music. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I wanted to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the Council or Magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. However, all unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you will be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I can let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it at, after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker will be Sean Stinson, VP of Sales and Product Management at Blackline Safety. Sean has more than 10 years of experience in the safety tech industry and is responsible for the market success of every Blackline Safety solution. Prior to working at Blackline, Stinson occupied the roles of Project Manager and Systems and Software Engineering at BW Technologies. He later took on the role of Product Marketing Manager at Honeywell Analytics. Sean is an electrical engineer with a degree from the University of Calgary. Our second speaker will be Kirk Johnson, Product Manager at Blackline Safety. Kirk recently joined the company after having worked in the tech industry for nearly 12 years and five years in safety. At Blackline Safety, he manages the, project, the Product Development Roadmap to ensure delivery of industry-leading safety monitoring solutions. Kirk previously was a lead hardware designer for new product development at Honeywell Analytics. He has a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Calgary with a minor in computer engineering. Thanks to all of you for tuning into this presentation. And Sean, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. OK, thank you. Uh, today we're going to be showing some new developments in the industry. Uh, and as the title reflects, we're talking about portable gas detection uh, and what you can do with connected safety. We aren't going to talk about fixed gas detection, uh, so if anybody's logged in to see that, sorry to disappoint you, but we're going to be talking about keeping your people safe uh, with portable gas detectors. So th this isn't just uh, Kirk and I that are, that are putting some opinions here. Blackline Safety has been in the market for about 10 years building connected safety solutions for loan workers. Uh, the thing that we've done new here is, is getting into gas detection and, um, you know, the background that we have uh, with the team here, the management team at Blackline, coming a lot from, uh, from BW Technologies and Honeywell. This team here has shipped over a billion dollars in product, uh, about five million gas detectors, and collectively we've got about 100 years of experience. So we feel that the, the team here and, and, and just what we've collected with market intelligence and who we've been talking to in the industry over the past years, uh, we feel a pretty good handle on this. And I think um, you know what we're presenting today and what's possible is pretty exciting. So I'm going to start out with a, a quick definition on what the Internet of Things is. Uh, so Wikipedia says, it's the interworking of physical devices, vehicles, buildings, and other items embedded with electronics, software, sensors, actuators, and network connectivity that enable these objects to collect and exchange data. So IoT is a pretty big buzzword right now. It's used across pretty much every industry, and everybody really wants to get in on it. You see it everywhere from connected thermostats to wrist activity trackers. In simple terms, it's connecting machines to other machines make our lives better and safer. We're getting to the point now where I feel like we take connectivity for granted. It's completely surrounded us in our personal lives. And in the consumer space, there's some amazing solutions that are out there. We all have smartphones in our pockets. We carry around the internet with us everywhere that we go. We can get Netflix on um, just about every device with a screen that you can imagine. You can check your locks now from anywhere in the world to make sure that your front door is locked. 
uh, in the medical world, we can report, record uh, ECGs and compare that in real time to see if there's irregularities in someone's heartbeat. So this, this tech has done amazing things for our personal lives. Um, myself, I use Google Maps almost every day, the Google traffic function to figure out, you know, what's the fastest way to get to work and to get home. So that you know, leads us to ask the question, why is the world of industrial safety not yet connected? So let's take a step back for a minute and just look at the current state of portable gas detection. So most detectors are disconnected right now. You're manually transferring data off of them. Once you have that data, it typically is just going to sit there. You're not running analytics, and it's just there for audit purposes. It's difficult to know when and where gas exposures are happening. You rely on audio visual alarms to alert the end user and those around them of the event. This is sometimes not sufficient for getting people help in a timely manner. We weren't the only company that's noticed this problem. So over the last few years, you've seen a number of different companies touting wireless gas detectors. So we've started to see that, and we're going to take a look at that throughout this presentation. So really quickly, just to cover some trends in the market, you know, and how did we get here, and, and where do we feel that the things are going? Where's the industry going? Um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, we saw the microprocessor move into gas detectors. So that allowed, uh, through that time period, a lot more features to be added to detectors. Um, we could record data logs. You got uh, the introduction of the dock around that, that period in time, so you could now start to record whether or not people were using instruments and, and, and record things like the calibration history. And then around 2001, we saw the introduction of very long life. Um, they, they, they were called maintenance-free detectors at the time. So these maintenance-free or disposable detectors were introduced around the turn of the century. And that allowed you know, people to wear gas detection that maybe couldn't have afforded it before. So we saw the price of detect detection uh, drop from uh, you know, $2,000 down to the hundreds of dollars. And now street price can be you know, just a few hundred dollars for these. So that, that was a trend that existed for a period of time, and that still is around now. And what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years is that battery life has gotten a little bit longer, uh, warranties have been extended, maybe the alarms are a little bit louder, sometimes the screens are a little bit fancier than another one, but nothing really revolutionary has happened uh, in about 15 years. So what is the next big revolution? Uh, Frost & Sullivan is a leading market research company, widely regarded to produce the most reliable data considering ga the gas detection market. They pull all major gas detection companies, so they really have their finger on the pulse of the industry. They really understand the industry, and we want to share a couple of quotes from them indicating what they think lies in store for portable gas detection. So portable devices with constant access to real-time data make plant staff more mobile and flexible to perform their operations. At present, wireless gas detectors are a small segment, but it holds immense potential as the products are capable of offering enhanced monitoring and protection. So with enhanced monitoring and protection, let's just build off that one point. What's possible when you're considering an enhanced monitoring and protection? And we're just going to jump into one example of the many things that are possible when you've got a connected safety solution. And this is probably the most obvious uh, thing that you can now do. So if you look at an example, if someone is um, hit with, say, 250 ppm H2S, for, for an example, they're kind of in that gray zone. Um, you know, they might, it might take a few breaths to fall down. It's not necessarily an immediate fatality. So you're in a zone where you can still help somebody here. Now, if you've got a traditional gas detector, I think we all know what's going to happen here. The gas detector is going to beep and flash. It'll warn the person that, that something's happening. But, you know, in that zone with, with certain types of gases, they may not actually be able to help themselves anymore. Even if it's oxygen deficiency, what we've seen in the market time after time after time in reading fatality reports is that people still ignore their gas detector. So in these situations, you need somebody else to help. If they're alone or if they don't trust their detector yet, or if there's not the discipline to actually leave the area when the detector is telling them they need to leave the area, these are all behaviors that we can help with. But in this specific case, the detector is going to beep, beep and flash. If there's nobody around to help that person, the worst might happen. It might be 60 minutes before someone's found. You know, they might be found because they miss a check-in. Maybe someone will eventually walk past that person. 
But whatever the case is on the bottom line there, if you've got a regular traditional gas detector that's not connected, that person is alone. They're on their own. There's nobody else that can help them because nobody else knows what's happening with that person. Now, obviously, with a connected safety unit on the top line, what we're talking about here is a vastly different response. And this is what we talk about when we say rescue versus recovery. So if you know that there's an alarm within one second, and these, these, are, these are real numbers that we can show, within one second, an alarm can go from that detector to a monitoring station where now somebody else sees what's happening. They can see the exact reading, so they know exactly that it's 250 ppm H2S. They know exactly where that person is, and they know the exact gas that's in the area. <clears throat> Within a few seconds, you can initiate a voice call now to that. This is possible today. The unit that we're going to show you at the end of this, um, and this is, the, you know, these are things that are, you're going to see coming into other spaces in the market. But right now, today, you can make a voice call now to that unit, and you can say, are you okay? And if they don't answer, or if they do answer, whatever happens, you can use that information. Let's say they don't answer. At the same time that you're starting to call, you can be starting uh, a rescue attempt. So like I said, you know where that person is now, and you know what the gas is, so you know how to respond. In the past, you, you know, even if you did know that someone was laying on the ground, if you could see them, we all know the first thing you do is, is not to run over to them because there might be another hazard in the area. So that meant that you would have to pack up in all situations and go in. And I'm speaking specifically in this case about an industrial environment, obviously. But um, So at the same time you're starting the voice call, you can now be uh, commandeering or requesting help of nearby people. You'll see them on the map and with the same technology that's, that exists today, you can call those people directly on their units and say, I need you to help somebody. By the way, you need to get an air pack on. So this is, this is just one example of what we're talking about today. So in order to do things like what Sean was just mentioning, one of the first things you're going to need is some type of wireless connectivity in your gas detector. So uh, if you look at the industry right now, there's a number of different ways people are doing this. So I just want to go through some of the main ones. The first one is Bluetooth plus an intrinsically safe phone. So this approach relies on companies already having large deployments of these phones. Uh, they can be very costly just to purchase outright, but also to maintain. Uh, they provide another failure point in the phone itself, and you're now requiring people to have multiple devices that they have to carry around and maintain. With Wi-Fi, you're relying on companies having uh, really expensive large infrastructure already in place. Uh, they cost millions of dollars to set up, millions of dollars to maintain, and you need to make sure you have that infrastructure everywhere. So if you set up a new site, or if you're going to a new location, you need to make sure you have that there, otherwise your detector loses all connectivity. With cellular and satellite, uh, you don't really have to have infrastructure because it already exists. The telecom companies have spent billions of dollars to get it going, and they spend billions of dollars every year to make sure it's the most reliable, fastest network around. Uh, with a mix of cellular and satellite, you're going to have connectivity in every corner of the globe. For software and data storage, the most prevalent solution right now is installing software on a PC or Mac. This can be a big burden on your IT to keep that hardware and software running smoothly and up to date. With cloud-hosted solutions, you get a reliable and safe method of running your backend software and storing your data. You don't need to install anything on your computer, and you're able to access your fleet from pretty much anywhere. Uh, it also gives you fault tolerance. So it, if you've got your system set up where you're monitoring things or you've got all of your back end and that goes down, you can instantly have that set up in a totally different location without having to do anything. The cloud, keeps, <coughs> the cloud makes keeping all your devices online and in sync straightforward. So just having a wireless gas detector or a program on your PC doesn't give you connected safety. Wireless gas detection and connected safety are totally different things. There's definitely, uh, you, definitely you, you want to, uh, you know, be aware of the, the specific technologies that are at play. And, and in some, sometimes, you know, you think that that might be below the waterline or it might be too detailed of a question. But as Kirk mentioned, the, the technology that's underneath this system is actually very important because the connected aspect is, is so big here. So you, you want to be looking for something that gives you ubiquitous connectivity. And as Kirk mentioned, in some cases, maybe a Bluetooth link is okay. Um, but if you really want to keep your fleet safe, your people safe, wherever they work, you probably want to be looking for something um, where you're talking about a cellular connection where there's more ubiquitous connectivity. So things are possible today that were you know, really hard to imagine just a few years ago. Uh, and so we're going to show you some of that here.
So what is connected safety? Uh, it, it's more than just getting your gas detector online. It's about combining key functionality to make sure workers are truly more safe than they were before. It's about enabling companies to better maintain their fleet and increase productivity. So for the rest of this presentation, we're going to delve into what is possible today and what you should be looking for in your connected safety solutions. Let's jump into an example of how connected safety works. This is um, a diagram of all the interconnected pieces that make up a really great connected safety solution. So on the left-hand side, obviously where we start is with the, the worker, the person who uh, needs to be kept safe. So there's going to be something that they're going to wear. Uh, in this case, we're showing um, a product that we have called the G7. So this has gas detection uh, built into it, fall, no motion, and, and a host of other features that we can talk about later. Now that can be connected in a variety of different ways. In, in this case, what we're showing is that these devices are communicating either directly to cell networks or through satellite networks. This communication then is going to have to go somewhere. Um, we run everything in the cloud, so <clears throat> This communication now goes to a server that's highly uh, fault tolerant. So this, um, we're talking four, between four and five nines uptime for this. This allows you to access this information from anywhere in the world. And if your PC battery dies, obviously that's not a problem in this situation because the server is up and running. So in that case, when you've got a central server, the devices are all talking to that server, and then the server executes things like sending out alarms, uh, communicating with other machines. So you can have APIs on here so that the information from your devices can be sent to uh, any other system that you want. If you have uh, an Esri mapping backend that you use for your own emergency response system, that communication then would flow through the server. Now getting into the other side of the equation, this is where your, your um, managers and responders can now log in. So there's a web client here. Uh, on the diagram, this is uh, the monitoring user interface. So this is where you can log in and change device configurations. You can change how your alarms work. Um, you can see where all your people are. You can pull reports. All that can be done through the web, so you can access it from a phone or from any computer anywhere in the world. Um, Texts uh, and emails can also be sent out through that same uh, system. Now, from there is where the monitoring kicks in. So if you want to respond in real time to alarms, you need some way of getting the information in front of a person. In this case, we're showing uh, the web client. And so uh, here you can have your team monitor uh, your own team. So if you have a 24-hour operation, like in a control room or a concierge or something like that, that team can monitor, or you can contract a third party, or Blackline Safety, we have a monitoring team here as well, so we can monitor. Um, responders is, is, the last, is the last link in the chain here. So uh, dispatching 911, if that's required across North America, um, that can actually be pretty tricky. You need backdoor numbers to 911. So if you wanna, if you wanna dispatch 911 in Los Angeles, but you are calling from Atlanta, uh, you, you can't just dial 911. You have to know the backdoor number. Uh, so that you get the right 911 dispatch center. And also with the same system, then you can dispatch your, your local responders. So if you can see all your people on a map, now you can call your own nearby employees who may be minutes away. Uh, and if they're the, the closest available appropriate responders, they can be uh, summoned to help out. So another really important feature is your connected safety equipment should be highly configurable. So not every user is gonna need the same type of alerts. Somebody might need no motion, somebody might need fall. You might have one user who has a one PPM H2S alarm while another has 10. Uh, so with truly connected products, changing these configurations should be fast and efficient. Through a cloud-based system, you should be able to update your entire fleet or just one user without installing any software or connecting the device to a computer. You should be able to seamlessly roll out firmware updates over the air with the click of a button, allowing your gas detectors to have the latest features and functionality without any downtime. Another critical feature that I've alluded to a couple of times is the employee communications. And this is something that uh, you know we see, again, with our existing line, that this is, um, it's hard to overemphasize the value of this. When you have people, um, that are wearing coveralls and you ask them to wear a piece of equipment um, and you know that it's a reliable piece of equipment, you now have a reliable way of getting in touch with them wherever they are. So if you have people that are working 
outside of cellular coverage, and they have a device on their hip that can receive a text that can be sent from anywhere in the world, and they can be anywhere in the world and receive that. That's, that's pretty valuable. And now we're talking about something that's a very robust uh, network. It's not a sat phone you know, where you have to be out in open air that costs a fortune uh, to maintain and, and you know, to pay service on. Um, the two-way voice communication is really key as well. So if you, if you ever need to get a hold of your employee for any reason whatsoever, either to respond to someone nearby or just to make sure that they're still okay. Maybe they just had a, an H2S alarm that was 50 ppm. Well, they might have just been removing a valve or something and there was a little burst, but it's all okay now. Now you can get in touch with them really quickly and just make sure that everything's okay. So the monitoring software backend is, is critical to this whole uh, connected safety idea. Uh, we're going to talk about, and what we use is a cloud-based solution. So almost every industry in the world is moving to cloud-based solutions, and it's because they provide the most security, they're the most reliable, and they're the most cost-efficient way to not only store data, but manipulate and manage it. With cloud-based monitoring software, you can access your system on a phone, a tablet, or a computer anywhere in the world. The software is always up to date, uh, it's always available, and it's maintained externally, so your IT never has to touch it. The monitoring software should make it easy to modify device configurations, change alert profiles, or manage your contacts. You should be able to easily update and maintain your emergency response protocol, so that in the event of an emergency, the operator knows exactly what they're supposed to do. You should be able to see all of your active users online and communicate with them in, in the case of an emergency. So that's through, uh, as John was mentioning, text or voice. The location technology that you use uh, is important. Um, it's obviously, uh, if you can see where your employees are, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with that information. We've seen everything from uh, more efficient dispatch um, to obviously the, the safety element that we've talked about, which is to dispatch nearby people to check on uh, somebody who may be having um, a safety incident. So now, w w with, when you've got just a, just a straight GPS uh, tech or you know, some companies use Wi-Fi positioning, one thing to be aware of with the location technology, again, is to, to look at the details of it. So GPS is really good outdoors. Um, if you're working inside of a, a building that has a lot of metal in it, um, GPS becomes less reliable. Uh, so it's important to look at um, just exactly how things are using or how the position is, is determined. So uh, assisted GPS is really good. That's where you're using GPS, but you're also getting uh, some information from cell towers. And then if there's some kind of a beaconing system to go on top of that, um, that's very valuable as well. So we have location beacons so that if, if you're working indoors uh, or you're working in a multi-story building, you can now see exactly what floor you're on. Um, and just a mapping uh, package, um, it, it's, it's good, but it's better if you can layer your own maps on top of this. So if you are now looking at the position of your employees and you can see that they're inside of a building, if you're only looking at a satellite map, you're just going to see the rooftop of that building. So you want to find something that you can layer your own maps on top of. Now you can put your internal uh, building structure in place. Uh, you can, um, uh, if, you're, if you're building a site, if it's something that's under construction that's changing over time, again, the, the static maps, uh, they're static. So you can upload new maps every once in a while as the site changes. So this gives you the ability to respond a lot faster. Knowing the exact location, if, you, if you're talking about response, is critical because you don't want to spend 15 minutes looking around in a, you know, a 700 meter or you know, 2,000 foot space. You want to go directly to where that person is that you're looking for. Let's talk about monitoring options really quick. With all these locations and all this information, it's important to make sure you have an easy way for your fleet to be monitored. Someone should be watching and ready to roll out your company's emergency response protocol should an event occur. You should be able to self-monitor uh, or have a partner monitor your devices, providing total coverage no matter uh, the date or time. It should be easy to set up automatic text and email but if an alert happens, it can go out instantly to whoever you want. They can be notified of that alert. They can also be notified of the resolution of that alert. 
proving compliance is one of the, the things that were asked for the most by, by safety managers. So when you talk about keeping a team safe, uh, there's, there's so many human factors in this. There's the change management element. There's the behavior modification uh, piece. <clears throat> and just, you know, if you need to keep your team safe and you have hundreds of people uh, that you're looking after, you, you really want an easy way of making sure that everyone is using their unit, that their unit is working, that it's been calibrated, that it's been bump tested, that all the sensors are working. And that can really be a headache if these things are not connected because they can be scattered over, geographically, they can be scattered over hundreds of miles in some cases. So you, you can't even put your hands on these units to see if they're okay. So when you have a connected solution, you can sit in your office and look at a report online and see exactly what's happening. How many units need to be calibrated in the next 30 days? What about the next 45 days? Do you have any that haven't been bump tested today that should have been? Do you have any with sensor failures today? Has everyone been using their unit? Maybe you've got somebody that's only been using it for three hours a week and everybody else is okay. Well, maybe that's just a quick coaching call. So you can now see exactly what you need to do to keep your people safe. And when we talk about compliance, there's also the obvious angle of storing this data so that if something ever does happen, you can go back and show that you at least were trying to do the right thing. So this, this, these are tools that give safety managers the ability to really change culture and to really make sure that people are doing things that will keep them safe. So now that you've got uh, all of this information in a web portal, uh, you should be able to do a lot of different things with it. And one of the big things is you should be able to run evacuations. So as you can see, everybody on your map, if, if there's some bad weather coming in or there's a gas leak or even if you're just running a drill, you should be uh, quickly and easily, you should be able to select them all and uh, send a message to all of them and initiate an evacuation. So in real time, you should be able to watch them get to a muster point or just get out of a hazardous zone. Uh, this can save you a lot of money during your drills by cutting down how long it takes to initiate, uh, run them, and report on your drills. Uh, you'll be able to watch everything in real time, which is critical for assisting people who, who need that help. So if you see somebody who's stuck behind or you see somebody who's not responding, you can instantly communicate with them. And if they're not responding, obviously you know exactly where to start sending that rescue during an evacuation. So lone worker monitoring, this is kind of going back to what our, what our business has been about for the last number of years, was using this connected te uh, technology just to keep people who are working alone safe. Uh, in some areas, there's a legislative requirement that you need to check in with workers, and in some areas, it's just sort of a best practice. So obviously, this, this you know, technology uh, can take care of these requirements as well. What is a lone worker? Um, it's someone who is working beyond sight and sound of others. And it, it, there might be other people around, but it's something important to take into account is whether or not the other people around are willing or able to help that person. You might have someone that's working at height and they fall in a harness, but nobody around has a ladder or even really knows how to respond to that. That person really at that point is a lone worker. So th this, some, you know, this technology can be used to solve other problems as well, not just, uh, not just the gas detection. So we've now collected a, a, a ton of data in this back end. So it, it's more than what's previously been available. Uh, so how are we actually going to use that? Uh, and so with a properly designed back end, you can start to aggregate all of your data, all of your user data. So you don't just have to look at an individual's data anymore. You can start to look at data across your whole fleet or across a particular location. So the, the image that's on the screen right now is a heat map. And it's showing, uh, it, these might not even be alarms to the user. It's just showing gas exposure uh, that's happened in a particular location over a particular amount of time. So you can start to detect trends in your data that previously you would have never seen. So in this example, you may start to see clusters of small gas detection events that could lead you towards uh, finding a gas leak or some other type of problem in your facility. Uh, distributors or service personnel can also start using all this data, and they can monitor in real time the health of your fleet. So they can be monitoring when your, dock station, your docking station may be having a problem, or if you're having multiple failures with calibrations, or if you just need new sensors. They can be watching that all in, in real time and know when they need to come out to you and, and provide you assistance or service or, or whatever you need. So 
So everything that we've been talking about today is available today. Um, this, what we're showing here on the screen now is something we call our G7. So this is a product that at Blackline we've been working on for a couple of years and it takes into account all the customer feedback we've had for the last 15 years. You know, our own knowledge and drive to really improve uh, worker safety. You know, this is what our families are asking for, people that work in, in industrial uh, situations. So we, we, we put it all into this and we're, we are showing a, you know, a, basically a, a device on the page. This is the thing that, um, that people would wear, but it's more than that. It's all those things that Kirk and I have been talking about. It's the, it's the server in the back, it's the connection technologies, it's all the um, you know, elements we've built in to make sure that messages are reliable, that they're handled, so that if, if you know, like a cell tower goes down for five minutes, the, the system uh, continues to retry those messages. So there's so much more than just what we show on the screen here. But something that's really important and kind of summarizes what we've talked about in some of this, uh, this works out of the box. There is no IT infrastructure to set up. There's no firewalls to deal with. There's no PC software to install. There's really nothing other than opening the box and, and getting started. Uh, this has gas detection uh, built into it. What we're showing here is a single gas unit. We have a four gas unit as well, and there's a variety of sensors available. So as we'll show you in, in the future slide, uh, the top actually comes off of this, and you can put different sensor caps onto it. So gas detection, fall detection, no motion detection, there's a check-in system that runs on the server so that if the unit is destroyed, let's say, you can still generate an alarm. So that's kind of a safety net if all else fails. If, you're, if someone's hit by a car and the unit's destroyed, you can still get an alarm. There's real-time alerting, like we talked about. The alerts go from here back to the server and down to your people within one or two seconds. This has a speakerphone built in, so you've got two-way voice. The screen, you've got two-way text messaging from you know, a phone or, or a computer anywhere in the world down to this device and then back up anywhere in the world. Kirk talked about the mass notification that's now possible, now that you can see and communicate in real time with all of your people and see where they are in a map. Mass notification. Live evacuation management using a similar technology. Satisfies the needs of lone workers, obviously. Um, and as we talked about, it's, it's all monitored through the web. So uh, Sean kind of mentioned the interchangeable head, so I'm just going to expand on that a bit. Uh, we feel like we have a really unique design with the G7 uh, to provide a modular interface with field replaceable cartridges. So our base unit has all the functionality we've been talking about, and that's really what's going to give you that connected safety to each employee. But for users who require protection from gas, all they need to do is slide on a single or quad gas cartridge. These sensor cartridges have a lifetime warranty. So just saying that one more time, they have a lifetime warranty on all the sensors in the cartridges. With field replaceable pre-calibrated cartridges, you will never have a day of downtime due to a failed sensor again. The flexibility in our design will allow us to continue to add new types of sensors and functionality to the G7 platform quickly and efficiently. So that's bringing us to the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, connected safety is definitely here. We, we are confident that you know, what we've shown you today, um, and hopefully we've exposed you to some, some, maybe some new ideas or maybe just um, you know, things that you thought should have been possible are now possible. Uh, if you'd like uh, any more information, if you'd like to learn more, uh, please visit us on the web at blacklinesafety.com. Uh, and there is, uh, you know, this was just really a small sampling of what's possible today. So there's, there's definitely a lot more out there. So we'll hand it back over to Tom to uh, start the Q&A portion. All right. Well, great job, Sean and Kirk. That's a really interesting topic, and it's one that is just going to continue to change at a rapid pace, I'm sure, over the course of the next few years and, and even decades. So thank you so much for your insights and your expertise. Um, before we start the question and answer session, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen. Your input is important because it will help us improve future webcasts. Uh, if you don't see the evaluation on your screen for any reason, uh, try turning off your pop-up blocker. You may also ask to access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Um, and with that said, let's go ahead and get to some questions. It looks like we've already received a good number, and I'm sure that uh, some more will come in as well. Um, so I'll start out with uh, 
A question here regarding the device. Is the device intrinsically safe? Yeah, uh, so it, it definitely is. So we have CSA, uh, Class 1, Div 1. We also have IACEX and ATEX. Sounds good. We have a, we have a couple extra questions here. Um, one is, how are, how are the devices, how are they bump tested, and how do you do uh, calibration with these devices? Uh, do you use a docking station? Um, another question, it, it, and along those lines, what about portable calibration and bump test bottles? Yes, uh, so they should be bump tested. Um, in, in Canada, that's actually a legislated requirement if you've got an LEL sensor in the States. Um, I don't think it's legislated, but it's definitely a best practice. Uh, and then calibration, we recommend every six months for calibration. And you can invoke both of these directly from the menu on the device. So you can scroll through with the buttons and just say, I want to calibrate now. Um, we ship a cal cap in the box with the device. So then what you need is a gas tank and a hose Actually, we supply the hose, so you just need a gas tank and a regulator at that point. And you can hook it up with what's in the box and calibrate or bump directly from there. Now, if, if we do sell a dock as well, uh, and that makes it a little bit easier. So you can mount that dock on the wall, and it, it's kind of like most docks are, are kind of the same. They do about the same things. It charges and it calibrates. Um, ours is different, I'd say, in that the, uh, there's no requirement to wire it into an Ethernet. Uh, so you mm -hmm. can put that dock anywhere now. It's very easy to just put that in a truck. Uh, it also keeps our dock uh, lower cost than some of the other options on the market because there's not a lot of smarts in our dock. That stuff is mostly in the unit itself. And just one more note on that. Uh, while we don't have Ethernet, the dock is still fully connected. So we're, we're using the connection technology through our devices to make sure all of that calibration and bump data is, is getting put back into the cloud. Great. Uh, another question that came in wants to know, is the device dual connected? Uh, if the satellite is blocked due to building material or any other reason, does the device automatically switch over to 3G or 4G and also vice versa? Yeah, so um, we, we definitely have a cellular-only version, but for people who uh, may have connectivity problems, we sell a bridge device, and so that bridge does exactly that. It, it has a, a long-range connect, long connection to the device itself, so you can leave the bridge where you know you're going to have a stable connection, and that can be satellite or cellular, and it will flip between the two of them. And then you can use your device within a few kilometers of that bridge device. The bridge also allows multiple devices to connect to it, so you can connect up to five G7s uh, on that one bridge. So it, it really lets you use satellite or cell. That all happens automatically. And uh, yeah. Sounds good, yeah. And then we have another question. I'm sure you hear a little bit about hacking. Could you please discuss concerns and precautions against hacking by troublemakers? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, Usually one of the weak points in any system is, uh, you know, social engineering, as it's called. Uh, so our, our system, from a technology standpoint, is very secure. The, the server is operated by uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, it's the same company that runs Netflix and a bunch of others. It's uh, very highly reliable. It's got different regions that the server can fail over to. So, uh, I mean, there's lots of, this is actually a pretty deep question. To, just to get to the hacking piece, I mean, everything is encrypted and we require um, fully authenticated logons. Um, so, usually, like, at that point, really the weak link becomes are people in your company sharing usernames and passwords when they shouldn't be? Um, but from a, from a general security standpoint, the system is very secure. Uh, and, and Amazon actually takes care of a lot of, the, uh, a lot of things like, um, you know, they handle the firewall, they handle dynamic uh, denial of service attack uh, prevention and, and things like that. I hope that's answered the question. Sounds good. Yeah, I know that's an interesting issue as well. Uh, another question that comes in, we have some difficulty with collecting calibration data. So is this supposed to solve that problem? Yeah, so um, we, we've mentioned a couple different ways how that will help. But essentially, all of your calibration data is going to instantly be available in the cloud. So no matter if somebody's doing a manual cal or if they're doing a cal with a, with a docking station, all of that will be instantly available to your supervisor who's ever monitoring the website. So um, it's all there. It's all stored. Uh, you can tell if somebody's out of calibration and still working. You could talk to that person directly and tell them they need to go back to work. So we handle all of that. Okay. 
And then another question, how does somebody know if their device is working and being monitored? That's a good question, actually. So we have, uh, we have a feature that we call um, SureSafe. And uh, there's, a, there's the, you know, a power light on the device. There's a green light on the top of, uh, the, top of the unit. I'm not sure if anybody caught that in the, in the slide. So there's a green light on the very top of the unit. And when that green light is solid, it, it means that that device is connecting uh, and talking with our server. So if any link in the middle breaks, then the, the light starts to flash. And so what's happening there is the server and the, and the unit are uh, exchanging messages. So um, you know, it's sort of like a question and has to get the right answer type of thing. So the user knows uh, that they're connected and an alarm can go off uh, on the unit if, if they become disconnected. And uh, on, the, on the other side, on the server side, uh, we can send alarms out if, if any of the devices become disconnected. So you can now notify both sides. Your employees know if they're connected and your managers know if the employees have uh, become disconnected. And I mean, even further to that, uh, we can run coverage maps. So, you know, if you're, if you're testing the unit out or if you just want to know kind of like, do you have any areas where people aren't covered? We get all that data in the back end. So we can run reports and say, your people here are covered, but in this area, um, you know, you, you're running into 8% uh, of the time you're not connected, and, and we might recommend that you move to a satellite solution there, uh, for example. Sounds good. Next question has to do with cartridge management. So how do you manage the cartridges, and uh, does one have to pay for spares? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, typically the way it works is we, we have a service plan associated with all of our cartridges. Uh, and so we would, it, it, we kind of work with each customer uh, to figure out how they want to manage that. So if they have a large fleet and they need some spares, uh, we can absolutely accommodate that. Uh, if they have a smaller fleet, then maybe we would just cross ship them replacements. So uh, it depends on the customer, but we we handle it uh, case by case. But then in the portal itself, you can track all of your different cartridges as well. So it kind of depends on the customer, but we make it quite easy to do. Sounds good. Appreciate your insights. Again, we have a lot of good questions coming in. Um, the next one wants to know, what hardware does your system utilize for satellite connectivity? So uh, I think Kirk mentioned uh, the bridge device. So our satellite connectivity, we, use, uh, we have a, um, a box that we sell, and we call it the bridge. And the bridge has a cellular radio in it and a satellite radio in it. Uh, so your worker-worn device would communicate to the bridge, and the range between those two devices um, is point to point. So through free air, we've measured that at uh, just over 16 miles or 22 kilometers. Typically in real life, it's you know maybe two kilometers or a mile and a half. Um, so that's the range that you have there. Now that bridge, the satellite uh, network that we use is Iridium. So Iridium has, and this is maybe getting into the details, but it's important. Iridium has satellites that orbit the, the poles, uh, so you get really good connectivity in northern and southern latitudes. Um, some other satellite networks may be less expensive, but you don't get the connectivity there. So Iridium, it's actually the satellite network that the U.S. military uses. Uh, so it's very reliable and has excellent coverage, and that's what we use. Sounds good. Um, question about uh, what is the baseline cost for the G7? Sure. So uh, the baseline cost is $489 U.S., and then our service plans start at about $20 U.S. per month. Uh, and so there's a number of different features and functionality that we would have to talk to you about, but that's our, that's our starting price. So $489 US for the device and $20 a month for service. Sounds good. And then another question uh, that came in, you mentioned that sensors have a lifetime warranty. Can you elaborate on this as classical sensors tend to have a life of a couple of years and then they fail? Yeah, excellent question. So the, um, we have a lifetime warranty on these sensors. Now, that's not to say that they're going to last forever. What that's saying is that if the sensor ever fails for any reason, we'll send you a new one and we won't charge you any money for it. So the sensor uh, sits in that little cartridge that we showed, and those cartridges can go out uh, either directly from us or through a distributor. 
these, uh, these products are offered through distribution all over North America and, and the world. Um, so your distributor, uh, for example, could have a cartridge, you know, and if, if they're just down the road from you uh, and something fails, they would dispatch a sensor cartridge to you. You'd pop it on. It would be pre-calibrated. You're, you're ready to go again. And um, so there's a, Kirk mentioned um, a service plan to it. So there, there is a, a service plan component, and that's, that is how we uh, take care of the lifetime warranty on the sensors. As long as you're engaged in that service plan model there, and it's just, it's, for example, $5 extra for the single gas is what that service plan costs, then your sensors have a warranty forever. So five years down the road, if your LEL sensor fails for some reason, a new one shows up at your doorstep. And uh, next we have someone who's wondering whether you offer any lease programs. Uh, absolutely. So um, on all of our products uh, and all of our solutions, we, we definitely offer a lease program. So if, if that's what you'd prefer as a model, uh, we support that. And another question that comes in, do you have simple units without gas detection that remote workers can use to address distress situation and provide communications? We do. Uh, so the, the G7 platform itself um, supports uh, quad gas modules, single gas modules, or um, just a base no gas module. And so that one, that's what we'd recommend to, uh, to people who are um, just working alone and there's no risk of gas. It's just that it, you can still use a G7 or we have an older product that we call the M6 and that's something too. So that's definitely something that we do. A few different cost questions, so I'll try to get to a couple of these, um, and there might be some overlap, and I apologize if that's the case. Um, is there a monthly or annual cost for using and storing the data on the cloud or through Amazon? Uh, no, so all of that is included with our, with our base service plan. So uh, the base service plan has all of that data being stored in the cloud. Uh, the additional things would be paying for, you know, gas or if we're going to be monitoring your team or things like that. But in, in terms of almost all the functionality we talked about in the cloud, that's all uh, included in that base price. And then this might be somewhat redundant. I apologize if it is. Is there a separate cost for the communication function data plan? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, so there... I'll maybe just elaborate on, on what Kirk was mentioning. There's um, three levels to our service plan. So it's not really like an a la carte. Um, you know, with, you, with your base plan, it covers all communication and um, everything that we talked about here today except for the third-party monitoring. So with your base service plan, um, you get access to the web. You get all the tools that we talked about. Uh, and then the idea with that is that because you have access to the web, you can now set up your own team to monitor uh, to yourself. Um, the, the next tier up is, is where we are doing the monitoring. So it's, it's kind of just a marginal add-on, and that's um, just to cover our people here that are monitoring your employees 24-7, responding to alerts. Um, the, the third piece, I guess the third service plan, is just the gas. So we, we had a question earlier about lone worker. Uh, so the third piece of the service component is just to, to say, how many gases um, do you want to have on your G7? And then there's uh, for quad gas, it's $15 a month, and for a single gas, it's $5 a month. So those are really just the three tiers. And like I said, on the base, you get access to everything we talked about here today, um, except for the gas and, and, the, uh, and the monitoring. Just one more note on that. The, uh, the service plan with the gas, it, it doesn't just cover uh, that lifetime warranty. It also covers all of our reporting back end and all the portal features associated with that sensor. And then for the service plan, is that per monitor or fleet? Uh, per monitor. Uh, the, okay. the only difference would be is if you had a large fleet, um, you can have different service plans for different types of devices. So you may have some people that want, you know, working very remote, and they need quad gas monitors, but you may have some people in a facility and it's really more of a, a panic or a distress button, and those people would obviously be on a, a less expensive service plan. Looks like we'll get to a couple more questions here. One has to do with the 24-7 call center. Is that uh, third-party staffing or is that internally staffed? Questioner wants to know. Uh, what, so what we talked about today, we, we have... Um, an internally staffed 24/7 call center. They actually sit just down, the, just down the hall from my office, so they're right here in our head office. Um, but at the same time, uh, using that base plan that we talked about, 
you could you could monitor that yourself. Um, so you could set up your own call center if you want, or you know, with your uh, if you've got a 24/7 operation um, in your building. But our our the one that we offer is staffed with our own employees. They sit in our building. Uh, they're part of our team. And I'll go ahead and make this one the final question. And just a reminder, if there's any unanswered questions or anything we didn't get to or anything that's a little more technical, um, those will all be forwarded along to the speakers and they will uh, get in touch with you. So the final one here is, what are the operating temperatures for these devices? Uh, sure, it's, it's pretty standard fare uh, for the industry. So uh, we spec minus 20 to plus 50. Plus, sorry, yeah, minus 20 Celsius to plus 55 Celsius. Sounds good. Well, that's great information. We had a lot of feedback through the Q&A. Had some people also just comment to say thanks for this presentation, and they got a lot out of it. Um, so really appreciate uh, all of your time and all of your efforts to, to put this together. Um, and again, for any unanswered questions, those all will be forwarded on to our speakers. Uh, once again, I hope that everybody does take the time to fill out the evaluation survey. That should be appearing on your screen. Give us your feedback, because that will make us better in the future. Um, that will end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Sean Stinson, Kirk Johnson, everyone at Black Line Safety, and all of you who listened in today. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.